good afternoon. And thank you all for joining us here at this year's Innovation Forum. So I am Margaret Martinosi. I am a professor in computer science here at Princeton, and I am also director of the Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. And I'm very glad that you could all join us here today. Uh, the Innovation Forum is actually now in its 13th year. Uh, it's a flagship event for the School of Engineering and Applied Science and for Princeton's community more broadly. Uh, we host it as the Keller Center, along with the Office of Technology Licensing in the Office of the Dean uh, for Research. And so at this point, I will say that I normally would have invited our School of Engineering Dean, Emily Carter, to join us here at the microphone and say a few remarks. Unfortunately, uh, Emily can't be here today due to a bit of an illness, uh, so she sends her best wishes uh, to all of us, to the event, but particularly to the participants, because um, she was looking forward to it very much. So let me tell you a little bit about the Keller Center. The Keller Center is housed within the School of Engineering and Applied Science, and its focus is on educating leaders for a technology-driven society. It does so by supporting innovations in engineering education and by fostering entrepreneurship and design thinking. The center reaches close to 800 students per semester. Pause, reflect on that. That's a big number for a university like Princeton, and we are really proud of that. Uh, it reaches close to 800 students per semester, both through its courses and through its co-curricular programs. Um, it acts as a nexus between the activities of the engineering school and the rest of campus, and it also serves, serves as a hub for partnerships and interactions with the broader campus community and innovation ecosystem. And we thank all of you who are a part of that broader community and ecosystem who've come here today. Uh, so Innovation Forum only happens once a year, but the many ongoing Keller programs and their interconnections provide ongoing support for our faculty and student entrepreneurial endeavors all year long. So for example, Space Touch was a 2014 Innovation Forum participant co-founded by EE PhD alums. They were accepted to Keller's eLab Accelerator in the summer of 2014. And then once Keller's Entrepreneurial Hub opened up at 34 Chambers Street in 2015, they were one of the first startups to move into an office there. So you can see this sort of interplay between the different activities that Keller hosts. Uh, likewise, Tendo Technologies, comprised of MAE grad students and faculty, participated in Innovation Forum last year. And ever since, they've been heavily involved in Keller activities, attending many of our office hours, workshops, and meetings with Keller entrepreneurial faculty. They are in the eLab uh, incubator this academic year, and they've been accepted into the eLab summer program for this summer. So I, I think overall, Keller is really pleased to play what we consider to be a very uh, integrative and central role in the university's innovation ecosystem. Um, I want to take a moment now to say a big thank you to everyone who made today possible. So first of all, to the whole Keller Center theme, thank you very much. And in particular, I want to thank four people, J.D. Jasper for event coordination, logistics, and support. Madison Ebke for on-site event support. I think she's out in the foyer. <laughs> Beth Jarvey for communications. We all heard about this, right? <laughs> and um, the incomparable Cornelia Holstrunk for shepherding and overseeing the management of the forum and making it what it is. Thank you. So I want to get more into the details. The Innovation Forum celebrates Princeton's innovation landscape, and it's well known, I think hopefully well appreciated, that our faculty and our graduate students are experts in research and teaching. Um, today what we celebrate are the particular aspects of their research that seem to have some commercialization potential. Um, and to form the program for this event, I want to stress that we cast the net really broadly. Um, you might think that this is mostly an engineering school thing or a science and technology thing. And I want to assure you that we sent an email that hit every single faculty member on campus because we appreciate that innovation comes from all corners of this campus and we welcome it all. Uh, so we sent email invitations to all Princeton faculty, postdoctoral researchers and graduate students, encouraging them to share out with you some of their research particularly focused on this potential for commercialization. I also want to thank 
an amazing panel of judges that we have with us here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> the judges obviously helped determine the allocation of the prize money, but as you can appreciate, the prize money is only a piece of the puzzle. Um, the real benefit to forum presenters is this chance to, uh, uh, for them to interact with you and for the broader community during the reception to get feedback on their ideas and to create some long-term connections. Um, while the judges are deliberating, we're going to have the privilege of hearing from my colleague, uh, my longtime colleague, Craig Arnold, who's a professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering. He's going to talk about his company, Tag Optics, uh, and in particular, he's going to highlight some of its growth since it won the Innovation Forum seven years ago in 2011. So this is another of these long-term Keller stories that we're happy to highlight. Uh, Tag Optics manufactures microscope and industry industrial lenses that focus in response to sound waves for use in bio biomedical imaging and laser microprocessing. So that's going to be cool. Um, this afternoon, you're going to hear from a range of presenters. It really shows the wide range of innovation at the university. Uh, that includes chemical and biological engineering, chemistry, civil and environmental engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, molecular biology, neuroscience, and the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. So that's really exciting. We're looking forward to it. As you can see, they span a breadth of potential uh, tech, uh, applications from biotech to infrastructure monitoring. Um, so in closing, I hope you enjoy this event. It's something that we all look forward to. I want to thank both the people who uh, ventured out to participate in it and also those attending. Um, at this point, I'm going to pass the microphone to our partner in this operation, uh, John Ritter from the Office of Technology Licensing. Thanks very much. Thanks, Margaret. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Ritter. I'm the director of the Office of Technology Licensing, and it's my pleasure to be here at the 13th Annual Innovation Forum. I was looking back when I was preparing my remarks and realized I was actually at the first one, and Jim Sturm and Vince Poor at the time asked me to prepare some remarks for the, for the very first Innovation Forum, and I'm glad to see it's, it's flourished since that time. Cornelia and Professor Martinosi asked me to say a few words about the start startup landscape at Princeton University. Our office, which as Margaret mentioned, is part of the Office of the Dean for Research, works closely with other groups on campus like the Office of Corporate Engagement and Foundation Relations, uh, the Keller Center, the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, and we help facilitate the transformation of Princeton's fundamental early stage scientific and technological discoveries into products and services that we hope someday will benefit humankind. For startups, we work closely with our faculty, postdoc, and graduate student scientists and engineers, as well as outside investors and entrepreneur collaborators to help identify and accelerate opportunities for starting and funding companies. And we've been doing this for quite some time here. One of our most successful spin-out companies Universal Display Corporation has grown from an R&D spin out in 1996 to a global leader in the organic light emitting device industry. UDC now has a market cap in excess of $6 billion and it all started with breakthrough research developed here in our Department of Electrical Engineering by Professor Steve Forrest. Another company, Bionanogenomics, was created in 2003 and is now a leading supplier of high-throughput, long-range genome mapping products and services. BioNano also resulted from curiosity-driven research, that of a postdoc working in our physics and electrical engineering departments. We've recently seen a growing interest in entrepreneurship on campus. To meet this demand, the university has implemented many new resources, including most recently a wet lab incubator across Route 1 called the Princeton Innovate, the Princeton, where's Anne-Marie? Sorry, Princeton Innovation Center Bio, Bio Labs. These resources have dramatically improved our capabilities to it and, and are enabling us to accelerate the pace of creation of spin-outs looking to develop and transform Princeton's basic research into innovative products. For example, in the area of technology maturation, we continue to provide funding to our researchers 
to address the development gap between early stage research and investment and venture grade opportunities. We call it the IP Accelerator Fund, and it supports the kind of proof of concept, data collection, and or prototyping research that often yields important information that can make a technology more commercially attractive to investors and entrepreneurs. We also have a vibrant executive in residence program with three rotating executives in residence who are available to provide advice to our researchers. Each of our XIRs brings to the position experience in leadership, business development, technology transfer, and entrepreneurship. Another relatively recent addition is the OTL's New Ventures Associate, Tony Williams. Tony focuses on the creation of research-based startup companies, and his, along with my other staff's tireless efforts, combined with some of these and other resources I don't have time to go into, have made a significant impact on our spin-out volume. In 2017, Princeton spun out 10 new ventures based on technologies creating, created during research on campus. And with an ever-strengthening pipeline, we are hopeful that such numbers will become the norm rather than the exception. I'm very excited to see tonight's presentations. Maybe one of them will become the next UDC or bio-nanogenomics. And thank you very much. I'm now gonna turn it over to Cornelia Holstrunk, the Executive Director of the Keller Center. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the 13th Annual Innovation Forum. It's wonderful to see such a packed house and we're thrilled that we picked today as the date of the event and not yesterday when there was snow. So thank you all for attending. So it's my role now to introduce you to the format of the evening and also to introduce you to our esteemed judging panel. We have nine exciting presentations. Every present presenter will have three minutes for their pitch followed by five minutes of Q&A from our judging panel. At the formal conclusion of the event, we encourage all of you to join us right out through these doors for a demo and reception networking session. At that point, it would be a wonderful uh, moment for you to engage more deeply with the presenters and learn more about their innovations. I want to tell you a little bit about the criteria that our judges are using to determine who will get the first prize, the second prize, and third prize. We have $30,000 in prize money that will be distributed to the top three presenters tonight. So the first criteria is the idea. How novel is the idea and the innovation? What is its competitive advantage? What is its IP status? The second one is value proposition. What is the market size and the need for this idea or innovation? What are possible mechanisms to generate revenue and or provide social good? Risks and challenges. What are the key risks and challenges? Milestones and budgets. And finally, what is the quality of the presentation? We'd be fooled if we didn't, didn't honestly say that the quality of the, of the presentation does, does matter. Once uh, the networking reception concludes, I invite you all back in here. We are expecting a wonderful keynote uh, speaker. Uh, Margaret mentioned that uh, Professor Craig Arnold will be giving a talk, talking about his journey since winning the 2011 Innovation Forum. At the end of the keynote, we will uh, go into an award ceremony, and please join us for that, because I, I know that's the highlight of the event. So now on to the judges. As I call out your names, please just, just rise quickly so we, we know who, who we have with us. Christine McCauley is the senior scientist, early proof of concept at Janssen, which is part of Johnson Johnson. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Nina Golobovic, who's the director of the IP group. Nina, thank you. Tom Vanderschaff, who is head of Edison Ventures and analytics team. Deborah Yu, who's the managing director of cross-border healthcare investment. Thank you, Deborah. Erica Smith, who's the CEO of Retnex Bio. Thank you, Erica. And finally, Ken Kilgore, director of immunopharmacology at Johnson & Johnson. Thank you. 
So I would be remiss if I didn't thank a few special people as well. I want to thank our venture sponsors, WIS, and uh, Matt Barbieri will be our, our moderator and our MC, and I'll introduce him in a second. Um, Tony Williams from the Office of Technology and Licensing, Tony. And a huge thank you also to the KC staff. You'll see many of them. If you could just raise your hands if you're part of the KC staff so we can identify you. Thank you. Okay, with that, I would love to hand it over to to our MC, Matt Barbary, who's, 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 who's has a mascot with him. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Cornelia. I'm excited to be here today. Um, we're going to hear nine great presentations. My only job here is to introduce the teams, keep the names uh, audibly correct as best as I can, and try to give you some understanding of what they're going to be doing, and to also make the presenters a slight bit uncomfortable should they go beyond the three-minute mark. So you'll see me standing in the corner, and presenters just take note of that. So without further delay, I'd like to start with the first presenting team, Alira, Infrared Biosensing, and we'll be having Khalil Shaw present. I apologize, and Alex Worth. Hello, we're excited to get the innovation forum started. Um, my name is Alex Worth. I'm a current graduate student here at Princeton. Um, working in Professor Claire Gamakel's group and the current CEO of our company, Alira Infrared Biosensing. Hi, my name is Khalil Shah. I'm currently a freshman in Princeton and the CTO of our company. Measuring glucose in our foods, our liquids, and our bodies is extremely important. However, all existing methods to do so require invasive and physical samples. They require taking our foods and liquids and exposing them to atmospheric contaminants or taking painful blood samples to measure blood sugar within our bodies. We plan to change this with our Glucosphere, a non-invasive and versatile technology developed in Professor Claire Gamalko's lab. Our Glucosphere consists of a quantum cascade mid-infrared laser source, an integrating sphere which collects the backscattered light from the sample, and a thermoelectrically cooled detector. So the sensor is compact and durable. All the components can be miniaturized, and the inclusion of the integrating sphere allows us to eliminate other uh, optical components such as lenses which can be easily misaligned. It's also very sensitive and selective. Uh, using the mid-infrared as opposed to near IR, glucose has a very unique absorption feature in the mid-infrared so we can very easily differentiate it from other sugars. Um, lastly, it's incredibly adaptable. By simply changing the wavelengths or by changing the collect collection mechanism, we can measure a multitude of biomarkers, not just glucose, in a variety of different samples. Um, we also currently have a patent pending for the glucose sensor in a variety of applications, um, which Cal will discuss. So our ultimate goal with this product is to provide a non-invasive medical sensor for medical use both in home and in hospital settings. We want our sensor to be extremely accurate, affordable, and miniature. The miniaturization and FDA approval process will take between five and seven years. However, in the meantime, we plan to adapt and develop our sensor to be able to detect glucose and ethanol content within wine. The food and wine industry is very accessible, meaning that we could have our minimum viable product ready to sell within a year. This not only allows us to provide initial revenue, but we can also collect more data to improve our algorithms for this medical sensor. Taking a look at the wine industry, we spend $230 million per year on wine quality testing. We can change these measurements to 30% we can reduce these measurements, changing them to non-invasive measurements for 30% less. If we sell our product for $30,000 to mid-sized vineyards uh, while manufacturing for only $10,000, this gives us a projected revenue of $40 million. So I'd like to thank um, our incredible team for working so hard to bring this together. And I'd also like to thank everyone for their attention. Um, we're From all of us, we're really excited to work to bring this product from Princeton to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. It's fantastic. Judges, do we have questions? 
Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I had a couple of questions with, uh, with respect to the glucose side of it. So obviously, non-invasive glucose monitoring is has been sort of a holy grail area for quite some time, and many, many companies have, have tried to do that um, using different technologies. And so I guess one of the questions is, how do you stack up um, from sort of R squared perspective with respect to the other technologies and because glucose monitoring is best utilized in a um, continuous monitoring fashion, do you anticipate that your technology will be applied in a wearable um, sort of device? Yeah, so um, sort of I guess the first question you asked um, has sort of two components. So first, uh, said there's been a lot of work, as you mentioned, on, on these glucose uh, sensors in the past. And uh, primarily, they've used near-infrared or, or uh, red light sources in order to look at glucose. And one, the glucose absorption is very small. And they ran into a major challenge, which is they can't differentiate it from other sugars. So when you eat, many things will change in your body. And because the glucose absorption is so weak and, and not very um, unique, it's really hard to differentiate it. So we solved that by using this mid-infrared laser source, which wasn't available in the early 2000s with enough power to actually penetrate deep enough into the skin where you're looking at the glucose molecules. So this is a new invention and something that's very unique. Um, sort of competing with other technologies to this day, I think that, um, of course, Apple and Google have been working. Apple's been a little more secretive, but Google is trying to use this Google contact lens, which looks at tears. Um, and glucose does not change. Uh, there's a large delay between the blood sugar and the glucose level in the tears. Um, so using interstitial fluid, which is what we're using in the skin, is, is much more useful. Um, and what was the second question? Just the, because glucose monitoring oh, is best utilized in, yeah. a, in a continuous fashion, do you have a way to... Yeah, so, um, right, so this definitely could be integrated in some, to some sort of wearable device. Um, all of the components can be easily miniaturized into, I mean, they're uh, semiconductor devices. So we have a demo outside, and they're kind of in a large system currently, but have the potential to be very miniature. Yes, this isn't so much a question as this just to oh, go back on that. We're all <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Again, my compliments to the, to the team. Um, one question that I have, and it may not even be a question as opposed to, to a statement, is that you laid out a, a plan of starting, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but from the, from the wine industry, moving that into to more of the medical indications as well. Is that correct? We, yeah. And, and I, I, I like that approach. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one thing I would, I would caution or one thing to look at is what impact that has on a pricing standpoint. So if you're looking at wine testing, and pricing the technology for wine testing, what is that going to do um, to your pricing when you get to more of the medical related services? Is it gonna, you know, if, you, if it's priced low for wine, you're gonna have troubles getting it priced higher um, right. when you get to the medical industry. So you, you sure. may have to differentiate how you present that, and things sure. like that. Yeah, so, so that's a that's a question slash comment, if you right. will. Um, I mean, that, that's a very interesting thing to think about, and it's not something that we've totally, you know, thought so, you know, robustly about yet. Yeah. Um, but I think that it wouldn't, we would need the price to drop almost for a home medical sensor um, to make this affordable for people to use, um, especially the manufacturing cost would definitely need to drop. Um, and I think that there is a possibility for that as this technology continues to improve and um, also as we improve our algorithms and sort of uh, move away from, currently we're using a scanning laser, um, but if we just look at a few wavelengths, uh, we could drop the cost of the laser. So that kind of answers no, no, it, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll um, add to that. Again, great presentation. Um, but I guess the, the question of, in regards to starting with wine um, is you, you, you're going to have to provide or build up capabilities in that in that area. You'll have to understand all of that. So it's it's good to, to get that out there to get the validation and the prototyping. Um, but I guess that's just something to be thinking about. You know, as you're building out the expertise within your organization, that you may find, although your initial goal was to do 
you know, medical monitoring. Maybe the, the real potential is in another area. Um, do you, could you provide just a little bit more of background about what the unmet need is in um, wine that, that you're solving? Because I, I, yeah. it's it's very creative approach. Um, yeah, so actually yeah. there's sort of a large industry for this chemical, and in particular glucose sensing in food and, and uh, beverages, and wine is just one example because it's sort of an easy... Uh, sensor. I mean, essentially, we have a sensor that's that could be made qu very soon for that sort of um, application. And um, currently, they do test uh, for glucose as it ferments. You want uh, the glucose levels to drop as it ch as the sugars change to alcohol. So it allows you to really closely monitor the the changes. And um, they do test for that currently, but using large tabletop systems. Um, like FTIRs or spectrometers. So they take a sample out from their system, they have to put it in this, it can cost $100,000 maybe, um, system, and they have to have a trained technician to do that. Uh, but with some sort of sensor like ours, it could be non-invasive, all you need is a window in the vat that you're holding the wine, and you could have someone who's not really so technically trained have some machine to go around and check it uh, without needing to take out samples and do that much more continuously. Um, so I think that you know, that's something that they're currently doing, and uh, especially something cheaper would be really of interest to these mid-sized vineyards that we talked about. The larger vineyards, they have a process already in place, but the mid-sized vineyards, which are growing, um, could really use uh, this cheaper, better uh, sensor. Great. Thank you, Alex and Cal. Yeah, thank you. So next, we'll be hearing from Bronco Glycic and Rebecca Napolitano on augmented reality software for infrastructure health and performance assessments. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Branko Glišić. I'm from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And collaborators on this project are Rebecca Napolitano and Anna Blight, my graduate and undergraduate student. So the aim of our work is to develop a method and associated software for documenting, accessing, and visualizing lifetime inspections and monitoring data of infrastructure using augmented reality. So the infrastructure in the US is aging and crumbling, and the American Society of Civil Engineers rated it with average grade of D+. Funding gap to restore the infrastructure is about 1.6 trillion, and this is why visual site inspections as well as the remote sensor-based monitoring are both needed and used in order to set priority, optimize the allocation of funds, and prevent disasters. So the challenges that come with this is that we actually collect very heterogeneous data that can consist of field notes, measurements, uh, camera images, and many other formats. And yet all this data has to be presented in a very simple, intuitive, and comprehensive manner, and also it has to be updatable both off-site and on-site. Another layer of complexity comes from the large size and complex geometry of the infrastructure. And finally, diverse audience has to access the data, and this audience con can consist of owners, uh, decision makers, engineers, technicians, researchers, and many, many others. While all of them might have different backgrounds, they all need to access the data and they all have to quickly and accurately understand the meaning of that data. In order to enable this, our innovation actually uh, empowers the user to access the, and visualize the data on site using their mobile devices with our uh, augmented reality software in, in, installed on them. So the user can simply come on the structure lay down the sensors, access the data of the sensor, and then even update the information with some new, uh, some, some, some new uh, facts. Also in the meantime, what will happen is that the data coming from the remote sensor will be automatically uploaded and made available. So our software does not require full 3D models, which makes it more advantageous and affordable for existing infrastructure. So our market potential is really huge, and I can easily make a business model of about 60 million per year only for bridges and we have all other infrastructure, and we also have international markets. Our typical clients would be governmental agencies, uh, utility companies, oil and gas industry, and many others. So why us? Because the current industry spends no money on research and development, and we know the market, and we know technologies, so we can match, uh, match these two demands. Uh, we are experienced in the field, and we actually created a prototype based on virtual uh, tour and inf informational modeling. You can see on the... Oops, Sorry, you can see on the screen the screenshot of this uh, prototype, and you can see it in the few more um, animations that follow. So uh, our software is seen to be adaptable to various infrastructure types and sizes, affordable, 
compatible with, with existing and new infrastructure, and it will enable optimized maintenance and preservation for increased safety, security, sustainability, and resilience of the society that it serves. So we need about 200K in order to convert our prototype to augmented reality, to test it on the real structures, to create demonstration for the clients. And we truly believe that we are low risk investment because infrastructure will continue to aging and inspections and monitoring will always be required. Thank you very much for your attention and we are looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Bronco. Judges? <clears throat> So just a quick question. Um, so who are your target customers for this technology and then how do you monetize on it? So that, so the, the, the clients could be, initially we will target governmental agencies. So for example, departments of transportation are typical uh, clients for this because they manage infrastructure. Uh, so how to monetize this is a really good question. So we were thinking because it's not the same if the owner is, for example, some county a branch of DOT or it is, for example, New York City DOT that has really large structures. So initially here, what we propose as a cost is probably something like per, per size of the infrastructure, like per square meter of the infrastructure. But definitely this, this model sh should be developed a little, bit, a little bit better. So I think it's, it's completely new as idea. So there is no precedent based on which we can really define what happens. Probably it will be something that also could be developed as we go. And you do rely on existing infrastructure, right? So we can use it for both existing and the new infrastructure. Okay. Both of them. So it's it, there is no there is no big difference. Thank you. Uh, good good job, Bronco. Um, I guess the follow up on the the value and pricing. Can you describe current methods and I guess is it largely manual? What what are we so replacing? It is, it is mostly manual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is it is assisted with computers, but it, it looks like this. You as inspector go on site, take photos, take some notes, come back, assemble report, and store report somewhere. And then the data that is that is streaming from monitoring systems is usually very difficultly visualized because you can have, for example, like data sets, the measurements, the numbers, or you can say, have camera images. Uh, something that is new and that is coming is really using the camera images to assess the condition of the infrastructure. So it's very, very heterogeneous. So at the end, the person who has to make decision and decision to be made is the following. I know that this structure is deficient and I know that this structure is deficient. So where to allocate the money first? So this person has to go through all the reports to understand all the problems and now, for example, if you think just about, you know, Straker Bridge is already a complicated structure. It's a small pedestrian bridge that we have here. Think about Brooklyn Bridge. Think about the size, about number of elements and everything. So it is, it is not easy job to do it, and it's mostly made manually. So our, our uh, 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 augmented reality software will actually help that, you know, you actually enter into the structure, you walk through it and understand immediately what happens. You don't have to go through the reports and spend many hours to, to do it. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for your thank presentation. You. Just a couple of questions. So one, um, obviously, as you said, the, the current paradigm is people just you know taking photographs, which is always going to be somewhat subjective and, and prone to error. But one question here is, is there any um, user interface error or you know sort of the 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 People, different people going in and, and taking pictures or whatever and or being in the virtual space and having any error. So that's part one. Mm -hmm. um, part two, does the technology uh, require a um, sort of baseline knowledge of the piece of infrastructure? So if you go in and take a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge or you're walking around there in the AR, does it posit the need for a baseline and, and how do you build that database? Yes. And mm -hmm. then thirdly, of course, what's the IT infrastructure needs in order to manage this? So we're taking pictures in the North Pole or we're in Iceland mm -hmm. or we're mm -hmm. in New York. How do you how do you beam all this information and manage the yeah, so, uh, IT costs? Mm -hmm. So I will start actually with number two, with the question number two, because this is this is a very important thing. So in order to, to understand the condition of the infrastructure, it is important to actually do the data analysis. Right. So you have to implement certain algorithms in order to understand if that's what happens to the structure, if, if the structure is in good health condition or not. So obviously the baseline is needed and the baseline is always made over the structures. How it is made, it is made, for example, if the structure is completely existing, so you go now on the structure, you do the inspection and you make a final report and you say, okay, this is my healthy state. From now and on, I start monitoring. And what you do in the future, you compare the healthy state with whatever change can happen over the time. 
So all this, when I, when I was talking about the data because of the limited time and everything, I did not mention, but the data that is included is also data that is, that is result of the data analysis. So, the, so, so that means that if you are, for example, bridge owner, uh, if you're engineer and you're interested, for example, knowing if there is any defects in the structure, you can enter into the system and look for the defects. If you are a decision maker, you can see what the data analysis says about condition and the rating, for example, of the bridge, and based on this, make decision. So all these things are actually are, are meant to be embedded in the system. So the amount of the data is large, and what we think, you know, the best way of doing it is probably to use the cloud. I am not sure that the agency would like this, so probably they have the, their own servers to, you know, to store the data and, and to use it. Uh, I don't really see any obstacle in from that point of view, because you know, every 10 years we increase our capacity to, to you know, store the data, handle the data, and, and in my opinion, this is not really a limitation. Thank you, Bronco. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Now, now we'll be learning about One, the two. Novo expression enhancer proteins from Shlomo Zarzitsky. Correct. Thank you. Hello. My name is Shlomo Zarzitsky. I'm a postdoctoral associate at the chemistry department working with Professor Michael Hecht. I'm here today to speak with you about insulin. Insulin is a protein hormone that regulates blood sugar. Any absence of insulin, like in the case of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, will lead to lethal consequences. Despite the fact that insulin was discovered roughly 100 years ago and was the first drug to be produced recombinantly, the prices of insulin are constantly rising. What you can see here on the chart are the prices of weekly dosage of insulin, or in other words, a vial of 10 milliliters produced by Eli Lilly, Humalog, or Novo Nordis Novolog. This price inflation is so ridiculously out of control to the point where people cannot afford insulin anymore. And we hear about more and more death due to that in this country. And here is my proposed solution. Very recently, I started to explore the use of completely de novo new design proteins as fusion tags. Several reasons motivated me to try proteins designed in our lab as fusion tags. One of them is the fact that they are expressed at very high yields in E. coli. They are well folded and very stable, much more stable than naturally occurring proteins. On top of that, our pure proteins do not require the addition of a purification tag and could be easily purified on an eco column. Owing to that, that we don't need the purification tag, the fusion of proteins of interest could happen on both N and C ends. Those ends are close enough in space to bring things together. And this is exactly what's needed for insulin. What you can see on the bottom is the molecule of active insulin, composed of two chains, A and B, held together by three disulfide bridges. Only the correct disulfide bridges will lead to active insulin. In our body, A and B chains do not come together by themselves, and they need the assistance of a chaperone C chain that you can see on the top. The main role of the C chain is to keep A and B chains enough time soluble in solution to enable an army of chaperone proteins to help with the folding of insulin. This is why when companies like Eli Lilly try to make insulin in vitro using the C-chain, they can get only around 60% overall yields. I propose to use deep de novo expression enhancer proteins not only to enhance insulin production, but also to serve as a refolding or folding template of insulin. My preliminary results so far suggest that I have close to 100% of correct insulin. In other words, the use of C-chain in vitro could be compared to a very weak, weak solution, while DIP is very strong protein that could clamp the A and B chains together and make this task easy. I'm currently at a very early stage of development, and every single stage here was approved, and I'm currently optimizing every one of them. With my preliminary results, I was able to draw the attention of one of the biggest insulin manufacturers, and I could say that we have successfully passed the 100 liter fermentation using DEEP and their insulin analog. With your help, I'll be able to expand this research towards in vitro and in vivo experiments. With that, I would like to thank you.
So far, the judges are stumped. <laughs> um. Hello? Yeah, we're on. Sorry. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for the presentation. Just a, a couple of questions. One, have you have you done any look around from an uh, intellectual property standpoint um, around the you know the, the Nova protein, if you will? Um, and then any thoughts on whether the the new protein, in essence, that you're going to be producing, it's, it have any anyone opinion on whether that would be uh, immunogenic? So, you know, are, are we going to be generating antibodies to this new protein, which is um, would not be optimal, certainly. So, um, again, IP and, and whether immunogenicity could be a, a, a factor here. Thank you for that question. So the final product would be insulin. I didn't mention it throughout the presentation, but DEEP will be chopped exactly like the C chain. The active insulin will be the same insulin. So we are talking here about a biosimilar. And my DEEP is only a template to make that insulin. I have a full process to chop off that insulin and characterize it. There are no leftovers of DEEP. But this is a good question about the immunogenicity of even the smallest amount of DEEP left there. We'll step in into uh, that research too. Now, as for the first question, as far as I know, and I'm getting a lot of help with the uh, tech transfer people here, um, there is no fusion tag available right now or patent that is completely de novo. There are around dozens of commercially available fusion tags. They are all natural occurring proteins. Here we are talking about completely de novo protein. And we patent not only this protein, but the entire approach of designing this type of protein. I think that, uh, can, can you address uh, the risks that you see um, to your business? The only risk that I can see here is that that big pharma that is currently trying our system, they might try to acquire us. And by that, they will keep the prices of insulin high. I'm saying to this audience here that I will not be willing to do that if they will try to shut me down. I want to make insulin to save lives. This is my main motivation. Thank you very much, Thank you. Uh, we are going to hear from Link Patrick on Fox Sensor and the capnography market. Thank you. I'm Link, and this is Jonas. We're a team proposing a medical device for measuring oxygen in breath. Hospital rooms are fitted with many vital sign monitors, such as heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, etc. But um, one important vital sign that has eluded fast real-time measurement is oxygen consumption. And so we're developing a device to perform real-time measurements of oxygen concentration in breath for patients in critical care. It's called FOX for Faraday Oxygen Sensor. Respiratory functions can be monitored through a technique called capnography, which makes real-time, time-resolved measurements of uh, CO2 concentration in inhaled and exhaled air. A typical capnographic waveform can be seen on this slide. And uh, here you can also see how different capnographic waveforms can be used to diagnose respiratory disorders. Capnography has gradually evolved since its evolution in the early 60s. And a lightweight sensor with a compact form factor is now an industry standard. So another important vital sign is oxygen, but um, oxygen monitoring, uh, or oxigraphy, has yet to evolve to this level. Measuring CO2 is useful, but oxygen provides the necessary information to measure a patient's metabolism, which can give more immediate warning signs for sudden conditions. Uh, examples include hypoxia, response to medication, or the calorie consumption of non-responsive patients. Another application is sports medicine, um, where the VO2 max test has been used as the benchmark to determine the ceiling of your aerobic capacity. Here's a video from 2015 uh, using the Douglas Bag method, an instructional video. This technique has observed little evolution. Uh, this is a picture from 1928. <laughs> so why hasn't oxygen observed the same evolution as CO2? Oxygen absorption intensities are four orders of magnitude weaker than CO2. So what are we going to do differently? Our device measures oxygen by detecting a fundamentally different property of oxygen gas its magnetic response. We have already built multiple devices that do this su successfully, and we have, our lab has shown in various publications, the capabilities of this phenomenon. 
And we have developed a suite of patented detection schemes that enhance the sensitivity, allowing for unprecedented minimum detection limits. This enables high sampling rates and small sampling volumes in line with the modern capnography standards. So what about the market? The market is growing by 15% annually and expected to surpass 1 billion during the next decade. Since this market is rather conservative, our vision is to develop an oxigraphy OEM solution similar to the CO2 module for capnography on this slide. Our sensor will be fully compatible with modern capnography systems and easily integrated into the equipment provided by large and well-known manufacturers such as Philips and Medtronic. We believe that our device will be a valuable additional tool for patient monitoring that will be used as a complement to modern CO2 capnography in the future. Thank you. Please welcome Jonas as he will help me answer questions or answer all of them. <laughs> I'll try to. Can you help uh, me understand your um, differentiation in, in IP protections? Uh, can you clarify the question? I don't. What, what would stop someone else from imitating your? Uh, oh, we we have um, some patents on this technology. So this is this is a different technology to uh, if you compare it to laser absorption spectroscopy. So here we're detecting the rotation of polarization of light. And that enables us to do balance detection in a very small, compact volume. So that's basically the technique that we're using. Thank you. So I guess, just to clarify, so black body IR systems and then laser systems would be the competitive technologies potentially, right? Uh, can you repeat that? Uh, black body IR systems or laser systems, th those would be competitive technologies. Yes, so, so the capnography field is slowly moving towards, uh, or moving away from the black body emitters. And this, this is uh, a laser system, so this will be... This will be on the and, and why are the other ones not used again? Is it because they cannot measure oxygen accurately? Yes, so, so oxygen is, is... Well, oxygen in air is actually a relatively simple measurement. The difficulty comes when you try to to scale it down because absorption is proportional to path length. Okay. So when you scale it down and you also want to sample very quickly, then it becomes a very difficult measurement problem. And um, just the intensities of, of the CO2 lines are about four orders of magnitude stronger. So CO2 mm -hmm. you can easily measure, but oxygen is much, much more difficult. So you're not aware of any other technologies that could measure oxygen? That there, you? there is uh, paramagnetic sensors that are um, indirect measurements that they also um, use paramagnetic properties of, of oxygen but those are difficult to to integrate in mainstream systems so this would be the equivalent of the existing capnography systems where you measure cross stack so you send your light through through your sample um, but for for oxygen okay and just what's your next milestone what would you do with the patents so, so the funds will be dedicated to developing the prototype because this is going to be the key we need to demonstrate, to test, and validate uh, a small compact system. I mean, we, 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 act, we need to, to scale it down and show that our system can rival the performance of modern capnography systems. Otherwise, people won't adopt uh, the technology. So it, it, we need to demonstrate it, and, and the funds will go toward uh, prototyping. Thank you, Lincoln Jonas. <laughs> Up next, we'll be hearing from Kurt Ristroff on nanoparticles for eliminating superbugs. Hi everybody, I'm Kurt Ristroff and today I'm excited to tell you about our technology for fighting against antibiotic resistant bacteria, also known as superbugs. These superbugs are a huge global problem that are on the rise and on the move. If you get an infection from one of these resistant strains, notify your next of kin, there's not much we can do for you. That's because old antibiotics like penicillin just don't work against modern bacteria. A possible solution are next generation peptide antibiotics. Larger molecule, more complicated um, therapeutics that are effective against resistant strains. These drugs are highly selective, meaning they don't kill good bacteria and bad bacteria have a hard time becoming resistant to them. Thanks to modern biotechnology, we can easily design and manufacture these peptides. What we can't do is protect them in the body long enough for them to work very well. 
The body quickly breaks down or traps these large molecules, so patients require injections, many injections, and often to get cured. If we could protect the peptides, we could dramatically reduce the number of injections a patient has to get. We want less drug, less often, for the same cure. Existing peptide protection technologies aren't worth the cost, though. They lose half their drug during processing, aren't scalable, and have high overhead costs. None of them have made it to market. Our innovation is a peptide protection technology that works and doesn't break the bank. Our patented process is called hydrophobic ion pairing flash nanoprecipitation. Don't worry about that. We call it <laughs> HIP FNP. The process wastes almost no peptide, has low overhead, and is fully scalable. In fact, we're working with a major manufacturer right now to design and build an industrial scale line as proof of concept. In the lab, we've used our technique on eight major antibiotic peptides so far and have successfully protected them inside nanoparticles. In the body, where unprotected peptides would get broken down, our nanoparticles are durable. Where unprotected peptides would get trapped, we easily break through the traps. As a result, much more of our peptide payload is able to reach its target, and by using less drug, our treatment costs much less money and achieves the same cure. That's our competitive advantage. This technology has garnered interest from two major pharma companies who want us to further test our protected peptides in mice and against the worst of the worst superbugs out there. Innovation Forum support will help us achieve these goals in 2018. In 2019, our scaled up industrial scale um, proof of concept line should be ready and we can begin licensing our technology to or contracting with major pharmaceutical companies who will use our tool to push back against these important superbugs and, above all, save lives. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Wow. Um, thank you so much. Uh, one question, and it's, it's kind of out there yet, so you may mm -hmm. not be to this point, but uh, are you looking at targeting both, um, again, we, we use the term superbug, I'm going to just define it a little bit more, but are you looking at both uh, targeting both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, or, I mean, do you foresee some issues when you, when you go to the, say, gram-negative route, where um, so, know, they're, they're a bit more nasty? Right, so what I want to emphasize is that our technology is a platform. We've worked on and successfully encapsulated eight antibiotic peptides so far, but there's no reason that we can't work against work with ones that work against gram-negative uh, bacteria as well. And just to give an example, some of the ones that we've encapsulated, um, the one I'm most proud of is, is called ecumycin, which works against extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis. So you have regular tuber tuberculosis, you have multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis, and you have extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis, and we can hit, we can work with a peptide that fights that worst one. It's arguably the worst bacterial strain on Earth. So another question. Oh, mm -hmm. I think just a quick question. Have you, you, you guys should consider, both you and Bob, consider looking at or contacting BART or Department of Defense to follow up on these things, too. Well, thank you. They have a huge interest in this. Yeah, BARDA is a fantastic place to get to get funds. I agree with Ken. So, um, since your yours is a platform technology that sort of posits the underlying performance of a peptide antibiotic, since you're a protector mm -hmm. of the peptide, so can you comment a little bit on the current state of the art of the peptide? antibiotic space? Oh, so the antibiotic market is supposed to reach $50 billion by 2025. There are dozens of them already on the market and there are hundreds more in clinical trials. The people are designing these things. They're, they're, they're doing the FDA testing. So uh, I should mention for FDA purposes, ours is a reformulation technology. We're not changing any bonds on the drugs. We don't have to go back to square one with the FDA. Um, but as people are designing and testing these peptides, uh, they can come to us. That, that would be one of our strategies is uh, setting benchmarks with a company who has a peptide. As we meet, meet each of those benchmarks, they would pay us a lump sum and then we would uh, work with royalties once the formulation's on the market. Another thing we can do, peptides have been around for a while. Uh, they haven't really been blowing up until the last five or ten years, but we can work with existing peptides that are already off patent. So we could do those internally and then license that to a manufacturer.
Thank you, Kirk. Thank you very much. We will now be hearing from Alex Goglia and Evan Zhao regarding photopharma, light-based control over spatiotemporal activity of therapeutic and commercial proteins. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Goglia, and I'm an MD-PhD student in Jared Tocher's lab. I'm Evan Zhao. I'm a PhD student in Jose Alvarez's lab. And so in both of our work, Evan and I use optogenetic proteins whose activity can be controlled using um, wavelengths of visible light. And so we and two colleagues are working to develop this as a technology that can be used to control the activity of any commercial protein. Commercial proteins are involved in many aspects of our lives, including eight out of the top 10 highest grossing pharmaceuticals, the food industry, and skincare. All of these proteins are chains of amino acids that need to be folded correctly into the right shape to function. Now, commercial proteins are manufactured to have specific activities, but currently none of these activities can be controlled by users. And so what this actually ends up being is for all of the above markets that we've listed, this leads to industry-wide limitations on growth. To address this issue, we've engineered a system to introduce light dependence to any protein therapeutic. We can turn it on or off. We first verified our technology using a yeast screen in which we couple the activity of our protein with yeast growth. Then, in human cells, we couple the activity of our protein, the blue dots, with interaction with the cell membrane, outlined in red. We can reversibly control this interaction using light. So, our technology and our company's most direct path of profitability is a one-step protein purification column for use in biomanufacturing, namely of pharmaceuticals, um, that takes advantage of our light-dependent technology. Current columns rely on caustic buffer solutions that actually affect negatively the quality of the final protein product. This adds multiple additional steps that are very costly to the protein purification process. And this is the bottleneck for protein manufacturing. So our system can be used to purify proteins in a solvent independent manner, removing the need for all these additional costly steps, and thereby increasing manufacturing yields and cutting costs in half for manufacturers. Our system works by taking our protein purification column, activating it in the light, um, which allows it to bind to your product of interest from an impure sample, and then the column is then placed in the dark to elute the purified final product. Um, we've spoken with industry experts who've helped us identify that there is indeed a market need for our product and have helped us identify a number of key challenges that we'll face. These include the needs for high purity, high yield, reusability of the column, and scalability to compete with industry standards. We plan on addressing the first three challenges by developing a prototype column in our academic labs and then partnering with an industrial purification CMO to address the scaling issue. So addressing these issues will provide us with access to a large, currently $6 billion protein purification market in the US, um, which we can then leverage to continue developing other products that rely on our same platform technology, including light-activated skincare and light-activated biopharmaceuticals. Funding from the Princeton Innovation Forum will allow us to continue developing our innovative protein purification system and will help um, foster our transition towards industry. With these funds, we will first use our yeast screen to screen through a lot of binding pairs and find the best light-dependent pairs for high purities and high yields. We'll use the remaining funds to build a prototype column for sales demonstrations and for travel as we continue to build relationships as we look for partnerships to help us bring our product to market. So we'd like to thank our current sources of funding and thank all of you for your attention. <laughs> can't let you go without a question. I've always got one, as everyone can tell. Um, so obviously you're, you're a traveling coach. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, can you guys comment uh, just a little bit about your business model? So as a purification technology, you're selling whatever you're selling. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, is there the possibility that you can... Um, you know, adjust the model so that you can get a piece of the pie, or kind of how are you thinking about um, what you're what you're doing, as opposed to you know a, a, a column in consumables or whatever. Right. Yeah. So I can talk a little bit about the landscapes of two of these um, big big parts of our company. The first is the purification column. So GE owns like the entire field of protein purification. They sell billions of dollars of columns every year. And so there's a bunch of companies that have started up in China and India and other countries that want to take market share, but they don't have any kind of specialization. They have no advantage over GE. 
And so their, their dire to license this technology, which we would plan to give to them and uh, have some kind of profit sharing uh, allocation. And for the dermatology applications, uh, there are a lot of light masks that people want to make consumable. So they want like creams that we can apply, which our technology is perfect for. So we've we would license that also. We've actually been in contact with business development at J&J, &J, interestingly enough, to um, kind of further this uh, for use with uh, some of the Neutrogena masks. Nothing else? I can't let you go then. Uh, <laughs> there's still time on the meter. Uh, so you had mentioned there was a 50% expected reduction in cost. How did yeah. we get that figure? That, we hear that often and that's pretty Yeah, long. no, so I think one of the biggest drivers of cost is like the literal number of columns that are required in, during the protein purific purification process. And by cutting it down, at least for tag-based purification, you would cut down from one to two columns, or I'm sorry, from two to one columns. So just by having one less column, that can cut your cost in half. Um, and for tagless purification, um, we can sort of engineer modularly a, a specific binding partner for any um, biopharmaceutical, which could easily cut the cost um, further than half. I could also add a little bit more. So for the insulin example before, the way that people produce it is that they overexpress insulin in the cells with pro-insulin attached to it, and then they have to renature the protein after it crashes out in inclusion bodies. For our system, if you can get the protein to express natively, well folded, you don't have to do any of that. You bounty to the column, you shine light, and then you I take away the light, and now the protein is pure, it's in its native state, and it's perfect for any kind of consumption use. Okay. Thank you, Alex and Evan. Thanks so much. Following is Arsalan Mosenia regarding Pro C Motive. Close? I, I was, I was going to say that actually. I'm, I'm so yes. sorry. I, I was afraid. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Arslan Monsenia and I'm a postdoc research associate at Princeton University. Today I'm going to talk about a technology that we have built in Princeton to bring programmability and internet connectivity into isolated vehicles and transform them to smart cars. We already have over 1 billion vehicles on the roads and we are each year adding more and more. And, more. and those vehicles do not support programmability and connectivity meaning that once they're sold, we cannot potentially up upgrade their functionalities or access the, data we, we, that are, access the data that they are collecting from the environment. There has been a few solutions in the market, transmitters that are trying to connect vehicles to the clouds. However, since the vehicles initially were not designed to support such functionalities, the introduction of those tran transmitters have introduced a lot of security concerns and challenges. It's been shown that those devices can potentially uh, make the vehicle vulnerable against a lot of remote attacks. In addition to that, the functionality of those aftermarket transmitters highly depends on the availability of the internet connectivity. And moreover, they are not suitable for a wide range of functions, including mission critical applications that require a short response time. In order to bring real intelligence to the vehicle, we have developed this device is called a smart core, and that is the core of intelligence in our vehicle. It can be connected to the vehicle in a secure manner. It can also interact with several add-on modules, for example, vo voice assisting uh, systems. It can also be connected to personal devices, and it talks to cloud servers, and it, will, uh, it, it is able to connect to an application store to get different applications for the vehicle. And at the same time, user can still use your own previous devices while we are providing secure functionality here in the smart core. To bring all of these functionalities to the vehicles, we have built the first vehicular add-on operating system in the world. And we provide numerous functionalities and applications. Such applications can either directly benefit the user, for example, reduce the fuel consumption, or they can collect data that are useful for different businesses and markets. In particular, we, and we are envisioning three different marketing channels for our product. The first one is uh, through the municipal and governmental agencies. We have already talked to several, several law enforcement agencies and we are developing applications for them. And we believe uh, we have several applications in the domain of auto related businesses. And for sure, a huge, uh, a huge number of applications would be applications that are directly targeting the users. And we strongly believe that the Innovation Fund can support us to run real-world experiments, real-world interviews with users to find out what are the best set of applications we can you know, propose in initial release. 
We believe Procomotiv has the potential to revolutionize multiple industries. Uh, we were honored to receive two awards from Princeton University over the last year that we used for the development of this technology, and we are currently collaborating with uh, several different uh, you know, in industries and, and advisors at different universities. And uh, today, on behalf of my team, I would like to invite you to join this journey for bringing this product into the market. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I guess I'm not entirely sure what it is and what it does. Sure. So the idea is that we build a device that you can connect to every vehicle on the road and make them a smart vehicle such that the device can potentially host a lot of applications that users can download from an application store. Those applications can directly benefit the user. For example, we have applications that will reduce the fuel consumption by a factor by 20% over a month. We have applications that will enable parental control for cars. Uh, and we also have a lot of applications that have been developed based on the data that the cars are collecting. Because in cars, we already have over 50 sensors that we are not using for any other purposes. Those sensors are there for the ignition, you know, controlling the different functionalities inside the vehicles. But with, use like, with utilizing all of the sensors, we are building a very huge platform for crowdsourcing in which we can utilize this whole data for, you know, for different application domains. For example, uh, we have built a map of temperature and for envir environmental monitoring by collecting the data that is coming from different vehicles as they're moving around the city. Um, so thank you for the, the, sure. the more description. Um, so how does this sort of, I guess, um, dovetail with what we currently have today, which is smartphones that sit with us, that travel with us. It's not connected to the car, but maybe, maybe I, I think part of what I, I would like to understand a little bit more is the value that's being brought to you know the user uh, sure. beyond beyond what we have existing. Sure. I mean, we currently have smartphones, which are there for daily applications for users. But in the domain of cars, we have several applications for the car themselves. I mean. We have access to over 50 sensors. In the smartphones, we have only eight sensors. And we, are, we can potentially reduce the fuel consumption of the vehicle themselves. Uh, and we also have the potential to control different components inside a vehicle. So if uh, there is this functionality, we can, we can potentially control the wheel. And we can detect there is, a, there is an accident coming. So we can potentially try to you know, uh, prevent that. So this one is something that, is, that will be added to the vehicle itself, not something uh, that we currently have in the market. Right now, there are some companies that are pro that are providing some, you know, like uh, some uh, entertainment uh, devices for the vehicles that you can potentially use to project your LCD of your smartphone to the vehicles. But those are there for entertainment purposes. There's no controlling functions. There's no real interaction with the vehicle itself. And you know, we are under we have multiple underutilized sensors and resources in the vehicles that we can use for a lot of services. Thank you very much, Arsene. Last but not least, Thomas Macrina from Zeta AI. Hi, everybody. I'm Thomas Macrina. I'm a computer science graduate student in the neuroscience lab of Sebastian Sung. And today I want to talk to you about how we map wiring diagrams of the brain, what are known as connectomes. Here's a connectome. Every dot is a neuron, and every line is a connection between them. Mapping connectomes is a top priority of neuroscientists because without them, we can't fully understand how the brain produces behaviors like a memory or a decision, nor can we understand how miswirings of the brain might lead to psychiatric disorders like autism or schizophrenia. To map a connectome, we first need a stack of images. Uh, the gold standard is electron microscopy because we need nanometer resolution to see the finest branches of neurons. Uh, what we're going to do here is color in a cross-section of a neuron branch. And if we do this for every slice in our image stack, we'll trace out a whole neuron, and we'll be able to see the other neurons that it connects to. So mapping a connectome is tracing neurons through an image stack. Historically, this has been done manually, which is unfortunate because that's really slow and expensive. Uh, here's some numbers from a recent effort. Um, it took about tens of thousands of hours, hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
it's no surprise that researchers have only mapped a handful of connectomes. And that's where artificial intelligence comes in. So for the past 10 years, the Sung Lab has been applying convolutional nets, uh, better known as deep learning, to automate this tracing process. Uh, so with the help of some commercial investment into deep learning and funding from the IARPA Microns program, this past year we had a big jump in accuracy and we were able to reconstruct a comparable connectome orders of magnitude faster and orders of magnitude cheaper. This is great. The field is loving it. Uh, and now we want to share it with other labs. Uh, so we founded the company Zeta AI to do just that. Now for, I, just out of the way, IP is not an issue. Uh, we're just building on the lab's open source software. Uh, we're going to offer two services initially. One will charge per connectome. So labs will upload their images and we'll process it with our AI pipeline. And two, we'll have a subscription service for like a Google Maps for neural circuits where they can visualize their data. Uh, our initial customers will be fellow connectomics labs of which six have already reached out to us independently. Uh, depending on the size of the data set will determine the cost. This could be a $5 million uh, annual revenue market. Now, we want, a, we want every neuroscience lab to map a connectome and we want it with every experiment they run. Uh, so we're anticipating we need to get prices down to around $1,000, which we have some straightforward milestones to do. Uh, this could be a market in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and beyond that, who knows? Uh, it, connectomes could prove to be useful uh, in, for, as a diagnostic tool for psychiatric disorders. Uh, our major risk is really that connectomes prove to be as useful as predicted. Uh, we, we have hoped that we're, uh, we're like the DNA sequencers uh, that kicked off the genomics revolution in the 80s. You know, it's time for a connectomics revolution, especially since we can offer maps that are easily accessible to all neuroscientists uh, so that they can finally understand the building blocks of our minds. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, can you address uh, use of funds? Sure. Uh, so right now, uh, we need some H-1 visas for some of the team members in the lab. Uh, you know, it's nice to get a visa when you're in a university, but when you're in a company, not so much. So, as someone who used to do electron microscopy in the in late '80s ish, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, you know, I, I like how you describe the the neuroscience applications and, and things like this. Have Have you guys had any thoughts on 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 from a value standpoint from the non biological world? So, I mean, can this technology be used? If you think about just technologies that are that are digging deep and then connecting things, um, geology, things like this, have you guys thought about any other applications to this approach, or is it, you know, is it limited to, um, to, to the neuroscience, which is fine. I'm just throwing it out there to broaden uh, things out. So yeah, almost all of our thinking has been in the neuroscience yeah. direction, but the artificial intelligence is you know universally applicable. You just need a, a decent amount of ground truth that you can train a model on and apply. Exactly. Okay. So. Our, our expertise is obviously in one very narrow field. Questions? <laughs> a very, very interesting science. So um, just so that I have a, a broader understanding, um, you said that what you, you've already had people engage with you and they've sent you data sets and, and you've started to manipulate those and, and be able to create for them. Is that, is the, are the data sets that are being provided to you of standard format? I mean, is that, so that's something that you can just kind of run and crunch and, and then you can stratify and yeah. scale on? Yeah, so that's actually one of the great difficulties that I kind of swept under the rug. And that's actually one of the major innovations of the lab is data wrangling, and no surprise to anybody who deals with big data. Um, they're relatively of the same, you know, in the same format, but yeah. So we have many, you know, we're able to handle data of many different, uh, many different formats. Okay, and that'll be your competitive advantage to being able to then map this out. Yeah, yeah. One, one of many. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas. Now that the presentations are complete, I'd like to thank all of the presenters for their effort and time and fantastic speaking.
We'd like to invite you to the, the demo stations outside. And in about 30 minutes, we're going to reconvene for the keynote, which I would strongly recommend you attend. So thank you, everybody.